Hello and welcome to another Property Week in conversation with uh, today we're talking about the uh, art of retrofitting on the road to net zero and we're joined with uh, our supporting partner in the climate crisis challenge Louisa from Hawkins Brown. Welcome Louisa. Thank you very much. So uh, to get us started then what's what's the relationship would you say between retrofitting and reaching net zero? Um. I mean, I think our journey to net zero is only at the start anyway. Um, if you look at some of the frameworks that exist around net zero, they're designed at the moment for new build. And we're still trying to get to grips with that. So a lot of the targets and numbers are based on new build. So when you add in the complication of retrofitting an existing building, um, you know, even deciding what the baseline is, where the target should be in order, you know, to, to ascertain what's good, what's best, you know, that, that side of the story is probably quite patchy at the moment. Mm. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's a conversation that's, that's maturing because you had um, recently had a, a business a climate minister, Lord Callanan, saying or suggesting that embodied carbon might well be included in the heating building strategy. So do you think it's fair to say that there's the idea of retrofitting to account for a com a embodied carbon is sort of becoming more mainstream? Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, there's been so much media support for it um, in the last few months even. Um, and actually a lot more um, a lot more reporting around companies or organisations or, or teams, um, you know, perhaps not robustly enough examining an existing building before determining that new build's the best option. So um, I think we're getting to the situation where I think it's 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 looking at a much more positive case. What might help push it sort of even, even more mainstream than, than it is at the moment? Is it a case of us seeing more companies get involved or, or does the government need to sort of, you know, put, push harder on the retrofitting idea or, or is it just about seeing best practice out there in the wild, as it were? I think it's a whole combination of factors. I think regulation is, is definitely part of it. Um, so Hawkins Brown were part of the UK GBC's recent project, the Roadmap to Net Zero, which will be launched at COP um, in November. And um, you know, part of the output of that work was the pol policy recommendations to government around regulation of um, certainly embodied carbon and, and also some more onerous regulation around energy, for example. And that would include um, retrofitting and the value of it with, within that. Um, I think the other thing certainly been discussed um, last few years is around VAT and the fact that we have VAT exemption on new build and not on retrofit. If you just swap that relationship, for example, it could make a real difference. So, um, yeah, some interesting financial incentives as well. Yeah, because, I mean, it's it's interesting to hear you talking about some of the some of the challenges there. I mean, let's. Let's go back a little bit. I mean, what are, what are the benefits of, of retrofitting versus just starting again and building brand new? I think they're multiple layered. So I, I would come back to the three sort of essential pillars of sustainable design, social, economic and resource. And obviously from the resource point of view, there's um, definitely a reduction in carbon emissions from the retention of the existing material, the embodied carbon. Um, but, um, you know, there's also the sort of social impact of um, sort of, you know, retaining the memory of that structure. A lot of clients come to us with a building of a specific architectural character, you know, no matter what era, you know, they've sort of fallen in love with a property and they want to rejuvenate it, they want to breathe life in. So it can be quite an emotional process as well. Um, and um, I think from the financial point of view, Generally, lower embodied carbon is generally cheaper um, and generally it will take less time as long as you're sort of sensible with the scope of what you're trying to do with that existing building. So I think there's a whole host of benefits. And then on the flip side of that, you've spoken a little bit about the challenges such as VAT, for example, which which strikes me as an easy fix. But what, what are the um, what are the other sort of challenges of retrofitting? Why don't we see more of it? I think there's a huge effort involved from a design team and really a client body around um, 
sort of information gathering on existing buildings, you know, right at the beginning before the design even starts. It can take a really long time. You're sort of working into the unknown. If there aren't, aren't a huge number of records, you're sort of inching your way along and trusting what's there and, and hoping that, um, you know, especially in regards to looking at the structure, you know, what what's the loading, what capacity can it can it fit is this load bearing is this not what what can we knock down there's a huge amount of fact finding before you can even really start scoping out the design so i think um the benefits of that are um you know the design team and the client get you know really embedded and emotionally involved in this process but it can take you know that part of it can take longer so if a um you know if a client's sort of trying to hit a programme or a funding deadline, you know, there's definitely a huge number of unknowns when you're working with an existing building. So that can be a challenge. It's interesting that so much of the, the challenge that, you, that you're describing is about that fact-finding, is about a lack of information. Um, do you think that will, that will change as we see more buildings being retrofit? Like, do you, do you find yourself looking to what other architectural practices have done in the past to help with that learning process or are they looking to you to help that learning process um i th i hope um with the advent of better record keeping and you know a lot of these things are regulated now whereas if you're looking at building you know from 100 years ago or something the records are fairly scant so you know there's a huge amount of record keeping that we ha you know legally have to provide delivering a building and handing it over now compared to perhaps what's available or what's been sort of kept um, you know of, in a building of a much older character so some of it's about what exists about that building and um, what's possible to find um, and in terms of sort of looking at other um, architects and, and, and what other designers are doing yeah I mean there's a huge amount of knowledge sharing but I think each retrofit is a bespoke project. So, some you know sometimes with a new build, it's, you know, it can be, you know, there's there's sort of standard wall types. There's maybe standard layouts, standard grid sizes. But when you're working with an existing building, every part of that is actually quite bespoke. And are there some instances then where because you're talking we're talking a lot about these challenges. There are some instances where the, where the challenges are almost just too great and, and retrofitting doesn't work in the majority case i think it's been proven that retrofit is a is is really the best option if you look at a life cycle of building in terms of the carbon saved by retaining either the structure or the fabric or you know as much as you can um but there are some occasions where it just doesn't stack up um and we have a sort of 10 point plan that we work through in, in our practice, which involves sort of looking at the structure, looking at the condition of it, looking at the, obviously in collaboration with the team, but looking at the um, loadings um, and then looking spatially at the brief, what can fit, what works with the grid, how much push and shelf will the client need to accept in their brief in order to fit it within this existing space. So. And, and also obviously looking at the carbon side and the cost. Um, so, you know, if, if the client's trying to fit a brief into an existing building that involves so much retrofit of the structure, for example, just won't fit without a lot of remodelling, I think that can sometimes affect the viability. But, in, you know, in the main, if it's, if it's a sensible brief and you're fitting it within a reasonably flexible structure, it, yeah, it works. It's interesting because I because you talk about this this ten point you know plan almost that um, you like to encourage developers to go through. Do do you find that some developers might sort of skip over that just because they they want the the new building and, and is is there? Do you find yourself having to convince people that no retrofitting is 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 the way forward? I'd probably say less and less. I mean, some yeah. Sometimes it's about the character of what they're trying to develop on that site I suppose and perhaps the existing building is perceived as a barrier um, but I think more and more clients are coming to us expecting to have the conversation you know expecting to have help in terms of determining whether or not retrofit is, is the right way forward for their project. Have, you, have they ever been surprised by what what you can achieve with retrofitting do you think there's a sort of misunderstanding there they think retrofitting is one thing but actually more can be achieved there 
again, I think it, that that part of it's probably about sharing, you know, precedence and and back, back portfolio, especially if, you know we share a lot of images, obviously, and press on our own work and and absorb influence from other teams. So, um, I think yes, I think sometimes it's hard when you've not had experience of the construction you know design and construction process perhaps to sort of sit in a space and imagine how it could be different i think if you haven't had experience of that before it can be really hard to visualize but you know the benefits of 3d modeling of revit of the various enscape tools that we use in the office and you know it's it's becoming much much easier for clients to suddenly see before they make the decision the impact that um, certain changes can have what about, because um, obviously we're talking about a lot about the relationship between developers and architects here, but what about tenants? Because they're ultimately the ones that will have to live and work in these buildings. How, how do they feel about retrofitting? Um, again, I think from my experience, it's quite, it's quite variable. So we've had recently experience with some tenants who have their own net zero targets, for example. They've said, okay, we're going to be net zero as a business by 2030. They're measuring their emissions. I mean, inevitably, in, in many retrofit cases, you have to accept that the operational side of it not necessarily going to be quite as good as a new build equivalent. So there's definitely a tension, I think, between what a tenant would like as a package, if you like, that would help to solve some of their operational targets versus what a retrofit project might be able to offer. But on the converse side... Um, you know, there's there's a huge amount about what um, inhabiting an existing building and and being part of the story of um, extending the longevity of that. You know, is it that's also a positive message for um, for tenants as well. So, do you find, especially with with city occupiers, you know, you, th- you think of a lot of these big companies in the city, they'll have these net zero targets, but then at the same time, they want big, new, shiny buildings. So how do you how do you square that circle? Yeah, I mean that's the bit that we're probably <laughs> struggling with at the minute or you know it's one of the knotty problems I think of the of the current age, you know, it's what um it comes back to the definition of what net zero is I suppose. I mean one of the one of the common frameworks used is the UK GBC. Um and they state really you minimize your ver- your emissions both energy and embodied carbon. You, um, as far as you possibly can, and then um, you know there's this, there's an allowable offset for the residual to reach the zero point. Um, we Hawkins Brown were part of a, a, a collaborative industry group that um, that we launched some information in May, which included a set of zero carbon definitions, and we tried to sort of be a bit more. Um, a bit more specific, I guess, about what net zero might include if you were um, terming yourself in that way, which and it included really meeting meeting local targets, emitting fossil fuels, um, and only once you'd proven you'd met certain targets, then then offsetting. Um, and the difficult thing with retrofitting is what's the target because they're all individual, they're all different. So that's something that I think with retrofit, especially, there's going to you know, there's going to be a lot of work around that. You know, Letty are issuing a, a whole 200-page document next Thursday on retrofit specifically because it's become such a big topic. That's a follow-up from their emergency climate design guide in 2020, so um, which was focused on new build. So there's still um, a huge amount of effort and energy going into sort of untangling some of these tensions. What role should the the government be playing in this because we talked a little bit earlier in the conversation about how what they're not doing i.e the vat is for for new builds versus versus retrofitting um is there anything they have done or they are doing or should be doing to to promote retrofitting versus building new there is a lot of sort of regulatory framework and road mapping that that could come more centrally. So at the moment, um, we're somewhat reliant on the industry galvanising, agreeing between themselves what needs to be done and doing the right thing um, and and moving everyone along. And to a certain extent, I think the local authorities have been really helpful in that. You know, 
a lot of the um, planning conversations we have now, for example, require far more onerous standards to be met than the building regulations, for example. So there's definitely a drive from the local authority point of view to support um, considerations of lower embodied carbon, lower energy and the circular economy. So they're all sort of linked. Um, but that's not coming from the central message. You know, the central government is at the moment quite mute on that. I f that is changing. There's consultation out at the moment on Part Z, which is um, a proposal to embed embodied carbon measuring and reporting into the building regulations. So, in effect, adding a new building regulation related to embodied carbon. Um, there are parliamentary inquiries going on at the moment around whether they should do that, how they would do it, and what the benefits would be. Um, and um, I think we can see from the GLA whole life report, whole life carbon reporting exercise that they started in February. We haven't, we haven't yet had a full cycle, you know, a full twelve months of the data that that scheme has generated. But we're only going to be able to progress understanding what good is and what best is you know by measuring comparing and forming up data sets um especially and especially it's especially complicated in the world of retrofit because as i've said they're all individual and they're all unique so. mm, yeah i suppose it's a it's a it is an interesting one in that respect i mean because we've talked about retrofitting as an unalloyed good but are there any bad examples of, of retrofitting I mean wh where do people I suppose go wrong when they when they try and do this it comes down to sort of sensible spatial decisions I suppose it's not trying to fit a square brief into a circular hole for example and um, you know being flexible enough with what you're asking for from the building that the building can deliver so if you think of some of the recent examples with, you know, a drive to convert, um, you know, sli slightly underutilised office space to housing, for example, you know, it's quite rare actually to see a good example of that happening because they're just fundamentally different building topologies. So um, I think you've got to be really careful about what you're expecting that existing building to do. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, when it's done well, it's, it's brilliant. I think we can. Uh, I think we can leave it there. That's a that's a nice, uh, nice, nice way to end. When it's done well, it's it's brilliant. Um, Louisa, thanks, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, thank you for watching at home. And join us again for another uh, property week in conversation with. Thanks very much. <laughs>